Hi, thank you for joining me for the Prairie Oaks Pulpit Bible Study. And we're doing part two of our study in Luke chapter 23. Uh, we've come to Calvary and we're listening to uh, the judge. The judge speaks and he speaks three messages on his journey and while on the cross. And we looked at one and a half of those last week. We're going to finish up the last one and a half of those this, uh, this evening. And so the first one, uh, we picked up, we started reading there in, uh, in the verse 23. And we looked at Jesus as he was carrying the cross, uh, even had to have help carrying it. He had been beaten and bloodied so much in the scourging that he received as well as other abuse. Yet in his strength, he warned those who were rejecting him. And he spoke to the women, uh, professional mourners most likely, who, who wept as uh, the men were being led to their execution. And he told them, don't weep for him, but to weep for themselves. As he warns, he gives words of, of condemnation for those who've rejected him that their rejection will have consequences. If you reject the Prince of Peace, you will have war. If you reject salvation, then what you needed rescued from will destroy you. And he's looking at two events, one immediate, the fall of Jerusalem, and the horror that will be levied against those Jewish people in Jerusalem by the Roman legions. It'll be something that prefigures the great tribulation when, uh, again, there will be such catastrophic destruction that the people will cry out for the mountains and rocks to fall on them just to shorten their misery at what is coming. And so he warns, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. And it's interesting in that picture of weeping because the previous time there's weeping mentioned in Luke, it's Jesus weeping over Jerusalem because he knew the rejection was coming and was already in play and he wept for the destruction and condemnation they would experience because of that. But for those that are willing to repent, they can be rescued from that condemnation. And that's where we pick up in verse 32 of Luke chapter 23. So let's look at that. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. I'm going to pause here in our reading because we talked a little bit about this last week as well. This is the half of the words from the judge when the judge speaks. And that is the words of mercy, isn't it? Because as he is being crucified, as the nails pierce his flesh, what does he say? Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And we saw where 
he prays for their repentance, that they would receive his offer of mercy, that they would receive that gift of forgiveness. And we saw where there's a Roman centurion, even one of those who was the soldiers nailing him to the cross. At the end of it all, he says, truly, this was a righteous man. Truly, this was a son of God. This was the son of God. And so we don't know his heart. God does. But recorded for us in three, uh, if not four, the gospel records is this exclamation of the righteousness of Jesus. And we can't help but think he was being saved as he put his faith in Jesus. But that's an exclamation of, of genuine faith in this righteous one who was crucified. We hope so, right? And so, and this time of, of being mocked and ridiculed, Jesus doesn't lash out. He doesn't uh, revile back at them. But as the lamb led to the slaughter, he is silent. And then when he does speak, he does offer mercy. He gave the warning. But as with all of God's warnings, as we see in the book of Jonah and Exodus and other places, when God warns, implied or often explicit in it is an offer of mercy, if only people would repent. And so we see that proven at the cross. So now let's go back to our text, Luke 23, and we're going to pick up in verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so what I read between the lines for the Roman centurion, we see spelled out for us in Jesus's second saying from the cross here uh, as he offered forgiveness and then we see one receive that forgiveness. So let's, let's unpack this here. Now, both thieves, both robbers, both rebels, uh, they both mocked and blasphemed him. That's what Matthew and Mark tell us. And then there was a pause, and as one of them starts to do it again, the other has had a change of mind. He says, do you not fear God? Do you not understand there's a judgment to come? A lot of people would act differently if they remembered that there is a judgment to come. We will be held accountable for our decisions and choices and actions. Whether you are the president or a pauper, you will be held responsible for your choices. And we looked at that when we were looking at Pilate and his choices. Do you not fear God? Do you not fear the judgment to come? Because every mouth will be shut because nobody will have an excuse before God. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has rebelled against God. And this one, he realizes, death is coming really quick he's being executed the same as this as the other two you're under the same condemnation you're dying but there's a difference here 
we deserve what we're getting. You not catch that? And we indeed justly, we receive the due reward for our deeds. He owns his punishment because he is owning his sin. He admits his wrong. And he ad admits that he deserves condemnation. It's hard sometimes for people to admit when they're wrong, even when they're caught red-handed. But this one, he admits it. He didn't play the victim. He knew he was wrong in what he had done. But this man has done nothing wrong. He too proclaims the innocence of this one, of Jesus. He's done nothing wrong. But then his next words are one of the high points of the scriptures because it is such a profound exclamation of faith as he on his cross turns and looks to the man on the middle cross and he says, Lord, you're the boss of me. You're the master. Remember me. Have mercy on me. Take thought on me. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give. I'm going to be dead in a few hours anyways. All I can do is cry for mercy to one who is my superior. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He believed in an eternal kingdom come. And he knew this dying man next to him truly is the king of the Jews, just as the sign said. This man is not just the king of the Jews. He is the eternal king of glory. And that this dying man, isn't a, his life isn't just ending. He's going to continue in better life because he's going to be resurrected. There's no other explanation for it, is there? He believes this guy's going to be in a kingdom and that he wants to be in it. Doesn't deserve it, but he just cries out for mercy. Believing this man minute when he said, Father, forgive them. Is there hope? This man has nothing to offer. He's been a sinner. He's already admitted his guilt. And God forgives sinners? Jesus said to him, assuredly, believe this because it is true. Amen, he, Jesus says. I'm telling you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Today, not at some distant time, not after significant delays due to processing or, or delivery delays. No, you will be with me in paradise today. We're going back to the garden of God. The kingdom is real. And you'll be with me in the king's garden. Something we talked about in our uh, Bible study last week. Uh, not on the video, obviously. But when it speaks of paradise, it's borrowing from uh, the culture of the day in the ancient Near East where kings in their palaces would have an attached enclosed area with trees and and water flowing and it's a description of eden with all this just richness in nature and this where the king would go and he could meet with people and they could fellowship together it's all those things are woven in the garden of eden and that's how this word is used in the rest of the scriptures, referring to God's paradise. This guy has no righteousness to offer, but he'll be allowed into the presence 
of God through Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. No works done. Didn't ever, he didn't even join church. Because he was saved. Born again. By faith in Jesus Christ. What a glorious thing. And so that brings us to those two choices. There's one more thing thing that the judge speaks. It's words not of condemnation. It's not words of mercy. It's words of vindication. Words of vindication because it's a word to those who have suffered unjustly or those who have suffered rejection. Those who've been on the outside Let's read it. Verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly. This was a righteous man. Did you hear Jesus' last words? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And now this is worth kind of comparing with. So, he had finished his work. We're going to look at that statement from John next week, Lord willing. In, in John uh, chapter 19. But he, the work is finished. And the alienation from his father is finished as well. Because you'll remember, if you read through Matthew and Mark's telling of the crucifixion, the words they have on Jesus' lips are at the beginning of his crucifixion. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's referencing verse uh, 1 of Psalm 22. And if you read through Psalm 22, you see a description of someone being miserably executed. And a lot of parallels to what Jesus endured. And so uh, Jesus is experiencing that alienation from his father to the point that he doesn't even call him father. He calls him God. And is also referencing everybody that he's fulfilling scriptures in Psalm 22. But this, this is different. Now he's back on those terms where he says, Father, I commit to you my spirit into your hands and he's referencing psalm 31 uh i'll let you look that up later verse 5 is where this this would be but that estrangement he's back to the son crying out to the father he's restored and that committing my spirit trusting that the price has been paid trusting that the wrath is now passed he breathes his last breath knowing that he is at peace with his father. He has done the father's will and he lays down his life. No one takes it from him. And the vindication is that he knows the father will vindicate him. Even though everyone watching except for maybe a handful of women and one or two guys, they have rejected. They have mocked. They've crucified him. But he doesn't put his stock in what they thought. He doesn't let that hold him down. 
Because in the end, his judge, his vindication is with his father. And that's a word for us to remember as well. Public opinion is a very fickle thing. You can be the hero one day and you can be the villain the next. But our ultimate judge is with God. And if we've done what is right by his word, then we'll know we're vindicated there. If not in this life, then in the next. And that's really what matters. Even if it costs me, I want to be right with my God. So that I and you, I hope as well, we can say, into your hands, O Father, I commit my spirit. I'm all yours, O God. You be the judge. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do what is right, as Abraham said. And so we see Jesus trusting his father. Death has no claim on him. He's the sinless lamb of God. And so he wills his life to death so that vindication will come. And you know how the story ends. Or at least you know what the next part of the story is. Within three days, he will rise from the grave. And everybody will know that he has been raised and vindicated by the Father and raised for our justification as well. So where are you amongst these three? I pray that you've cried out for that mercy that is at the hands of Jesus with confession of sin, repentance, and trusting in him, knowing that the best vindication we can have is in his kingdom. God bless, God keep you. Thanks for joining me. It is a privilege to bring God's word to you. See you next time.